Robert Home, first in the chat. <clears throat> right behind him is Kevin's card collecting and more. Good morning, everybody. This is Donald Blomdahl, Hall of Fame veteran, sports cards and collectibles. Coming to you live from Arlington, Washington. Hopefully you guys are having a great start to your Thursday. And hopefully you're ready for another baseball team video series. History of the Houston Astros. Hopefully you guys are ready for another great program today. Hopefully things are going well in your neck of the woods. Trying to remember who it was that chose this one. This is a super long history lesson. So hopefully you guys are ready for some fun and know some let's see. Oh man, Robert beat me by point zero 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 one second. That's right. You guys were neck and neck there. <laughs> That's for sure. But do appreciate you guys popping into the stream here. Really do appreciate that. That is for sure. I'm going to give it probably about two more minutes. Brewers cards forever. I love the Brewers, but used to live in Houston, so here I am. <laughs> All right, looking forward to the Houston Astros team history. So hopefully you guys are excited about today. Um, give you a slight little background before we get into our overall history. Um, so in 1969 to 1993, they were part of the West Division for the National League. And then they switched to the Central Division in 94 through 2012. So from 1962 to 2012, they were in the National League. And then starting in 2013 to present, they were, they are, then, they were then switched to the West Division of the American League. Okay. Um I'm sorry for anyone who lives in Houston. <laughs> All right there, Robert. You be nice there today. <laughs> but we got about... Oh, it is 10.35, so we will get into the content at hand. And I will make sure I keep an eye on the chat here as much as possible. Look up at my computer after each little section as we roll along. So the Houston Astros... And of course, then I, I did not have any family mail call packages today. I did have a package delivered yesterday, but it was um, it was my wife's medications. So uh, that is actually no, it wasn't her medications. It was some some vitamin supplements that she gets through the mail. So Houston Astros is our history lesson for today for teams, uh, baseball teams. The Houston Astros are an American League professional baseball team based in Houston, Texas. The Astros compete in Major League Baseball as a member club of the American League West Division, having moved the di to the division in 2013 after spending their first 51 seasons in the National League. The Astros were established as a Houston Colt 40 as the Houston Colt 45s and entered the National League as an expansion team in 1962 along with the New York Mets. The current name reflecting Houston's role as the host of Johnson Space Center was adopted 3 years later when they moved into the Astrodome, the first dome sports stadium and so-called the eighth wonder of the world. The Astros moved to a new stadium called Minute Maid Park in 2000. 
The Astros played in the National League West Division from 1969 to 1993, then the National League Central Division from 1994 to 2012, before being moved to the American League West as part of a minor realignment in 2013. The Astros posted their first winning record in 1972 and made the playoffs for the first time in 1980. The team made its first World Series appearance in 2005 as a National League team, only to be swept by the Chicago White Sox. The team embraced sabermetrics and new technologies in the 2010s, transforming from a tanking 100-loss team into a powerhouse. The Astros won the 2017 World Series, their first championship against the Los Angeles Dodgers, in seven games in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. They returned to World the World Series in 2019, losing to the Washington Nationals in seven games. On January 13, 2020, Astros manager A.J. Hinch and general manager Jeff uh, Lunnell were suspended by Major League Baseball for one year after the, an investigation confirmed sign stealing by the Astros during the two, their 2017 World Series campaign. Both men were fired by the team shortly thereafter. Okay, before I get into the next section, let me pop into the chat here. Da, 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 da. I felt loud. Uh, Aren't you a Texan, Robert? <laughs> Brewers cards. Well, I live in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin now, and the Chippewa Falls, Dawson's. Uh, sorry, I lived there for a year. <laughs> Kevin says, I went to Houston once to visit NASA. Fascinating place. I loved it. Lucky, lucky's in the house. I went to the Astrodome in 1975, and it was an awesome, an awful place to watch a game. Oh, I thought it was awesome for a second there. Sorry, Lucky. Uh, I lived a couple miles away from there, just outside Pasadena. Used to visit NASA all the time. Wanted to be an astronaut? I mean, who who wouldn't? <laughs> Does anyone know who hit the first home run in the Astrodome? I don't know for sure on that one, Robert. I was not a big Houston Astros fan, although I did watch some of their games uh, when they were on TV when I was a kid. But other than that, let's go ahead and go into our next section here. Looks like I'm caught up to the chat. I know Robert, but I will let others guess. <laughs> Brewers cards forever says, my mom. <laughs> Franchise history. Major League Baseball comes to Texas from 18. 1888 until 1961, Houston's professional baseball club was the minor league Houston Buffaloes. Although expansion from the National League eventually brought an MLB team to Texas in 1962, Houston officials had been making efforts to do so for years prior. There were four men chiefly responsible for bringing Major League Baseball to Houston, George Kersky and Craig Cullinan, who had led a futile attempt to purchase the St. Louis Cardinals in 1952. R.E. Bob Smith, a prominent oil man and real estate magnet in Houston, who was brought in for his financial resources, and Judge Roy Hoffines, a former mayor of Houston and Harris County judge, who was recruited for his salesmanship and political style. They formed the Houston Sports Association as their vehicle for attaining a big league franchise for the city of Houston. Given MLB's refusal to consider expansion, Kersky, Cullinan, Smith, and Hoffheintz joined forces with would-be owners from other cities and announced the formation of a new league to compete with the established National and American Leagues. They called the new league the Continental League, wanting to protect potential new markets. Both existing leagues chose to expand from eight teams to ten. However, plans fell through for the Houston franchise after the Houston Buffaloes owner, Marty Marion, could not come to an agreement with the HSA 
to sell the team. To make matters worse, the Continental League as a whole folded in August 1960. Pop in the chat here real quick. Um, You might have to give hints, Robert. Tommy Harper, strike one, Brewer's Cards. (laughs) Give you a hint. It wasn't Brewer's Cards Forever's mom. (laughs) Brewer's, uh, are you... Talking about Pasadena, California? Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, just reading through the chat and just chuckling along the way. All right. So, uh, the new Houston team was named the Colt 45s after a Name the Team contest was won by William Irving Netter. The Colt 45 was well known as the gun that won the West. The colors selected were navy and and orange. The first team was formed mostly through an expansion draft after the 1961 season. The Colt 45s and their expansion cousins, the New York Mets, took turns choosing players left unprotected by other National League franchises. Many of those associated with the Houston Buffaloes organization were allowed by the ownership to continue in the major league. Manager Harry Kraft, who had joined Houston in 1961, remained the same position for the team until the end of the 1964 season. General Manager uh, Speck Richardson also continued with the organization as business manager, but was later promoted again to the same position with the Astros from 1967 until 1975. Although most players for the Major League franchise were obtained through the 1961 Major League Baseball expansion draft, uh, Buffs players J.C. Hartman, Pidge Brown, Jim Campbell, Ron Davis, Dave Glusty, and Dave Roberts were chosen to continue as Major League Ball players. Similarly, the radio broadcasting team remained with the new Houston Major League franchise. Lowell Passy worked alongside Gene Elston as a color commentator until he retired from broadcasting in 1976. Elston continued with the Astros until 1986. The Colt 45s began their existence playing at Colt Stadium, a temporary venue built just north of the construction site of the indoor stadium. All right. Uh, uh, No, no, Johnson Space Center in Pasadena, Texas. Same town as Gillies. Peek into... Oh, peek into Super Channel. How you doing there, peek into Super Channel? Thanks for popping into the chat here. Hopefully you'll check each other's channels out when you do get the chance. But uh, I will... As long as you uh, like, comment, and subscribe the right way there, peek into Super Channel, I'll pay your channel a visit also. Oh, I didn't know Texas had a Pasadena as well. Interesting. <laughs> Hello, Peak. You can smell it before you see it. Cowtown. No refinery. Uh, Brewers cards forever. Mickey Mantle. I cheated. Got you. They smell too. Google is a beautiful thing. Robert then finally says, you are correct. Mickey Mantle hit the first home run in the Astrodome. Pretty cool. All right. So I think I'm caught up in the chat here. So in 1962 to 1964, the Colt 45s. So the Colt 45 started their inaugural season on April 10th, 1962 against the Chicago Cubs with Harry Kraft as the Colt 45s manager. Bob Aspromonte scored the first run for the Colt 45s on an Al Spangler triple in the first inning. They started the season with a three-game sweep of the Cubs, but eventually finished eighth among the National League's ten teams. The team's best pitcher, Richard Turk Farrell, lost 20 games despite an ERA of 3.02, a starter for the Colt 45s. Farrell was primarily a relief pitcher prior to playing for Houston. He was selected to both All-Star Games in 1962. The 1963 season saw 
More young talent mixed with seasoned veterans, Jimmy Wynn, Rusty Staub, and Joe Morgan, all made their Major League debuts the 1963 season. However, Houston's positions in the standings did not improve, as the Colt 45s finished in ninth place with a 66 and nine, or, yeah, 66 and 96 record. The team was still building, trying to find that perfect mix to complete compete. The 1964 campaign began on a sad note as relief pitcher Jim Umbricht died of cancer at the age of 33 on April 8th, just before opening day. Umbricht was the only Colt 45 pitcher to post a winning record in Houston's first two seasons. He was so well liked by players and fans, the team retired his jersey number 32 in 1965. Just on the horizon, the structure of the new Dome Stadium was more prevalent and would soon change the way baseball was watched in Houston and around the league. On December 1st, 1964, the team announced the name change from the Colt 45s to the Houston Astros. All right. Let me pop in the chat real quick here. Um, Wesley Tonneson... Hey, Donald in the chat. Thanks for popping in here, Wesley. Nice to see you here today. Uh, sounds like Ryan's 8-16 and 16 record the year he led the league in ERA at 2.76 strikeouts. Uh, good morning, Wesley. <laughs> All right. Hey, Kevin. All right. Looks like I'm caught back up on the chat. So let's get on with our history lesson here. So in as far as the Houston Astros, in 1965 through 1970, the great indoors. With Judge Roy Hoffheinz, now the sole owner of the franchise and the new venue com- complete, the renamed Astros moved into their new dome stadium, the Astrodome, in 1965. The name honored Houston's position as the center for the nation's space program, NASA's new manned space spacecraft center had recently opened southeast of the city the astrodome coined the eighth wonder of the world did little to improve the home team's results in the field while several indoor firsts were accomplished the team still finished ninth in the standings the attendance was uh, high not because the team's accomplishments but because the people came from miles around to see the astrodome Just as the excitement was settling down over the Astrodome, the 1966 season found something new to put the Dome Stadium in the spotlight once again, the field. The grass would not grow in the new park. Since the roof panels had been painted to reduce the glare that was causing players on both Astros and visiting teams to miss routine pop flies, the new artificial turf was created called AstroTurf. The H- and Houston would be involved in yet another change in the way the game was played. All right. Da, da, da. So with new uh, manager Grady Hatton, the Astros started the 1966 season strong. By May, they were in second place in the National League and looked like a team that could contend. Joe Morgan was named a starter on the All-Star team. The success did not last as they lost Jimmy Wynn for the season after he crashed into an outfield fence in Philadelphia and Morgan had broken his kneecap. The 1967 season saw first baseman Eddie Matthews join the Astros. The slugger hit his 500th home run while in Houston, and he would be traded late in the season, and Doug Rader would be prompted to be to the big legs. Uh, rookie Don Wilson pitched a no-hitter on, July, on June 18th. Wynn also provided some enthusiasm in 1967, the, nine, the five foot nine inch Wynn was becoming known not only for how often he hit home runs, but also for how far he hit them. Wynn set club records with 37 home runs and 107 RBIs. He was also in 1960. It was also in 1967 that Wynn hit his famous home run onto Interstate 75 in Cincinnati. 
As the season came to a close, the Astros found themselves again in ninth place and with a winning percentage below 500. The team looked good on paper, but could, could not make it work on the field. Okay. Uh, Kevin's card collect. Kevin must have gotten a call. He probably had, had to take off for a minute. He said he'll be right back. All right. So... April 15, 1968, saw a pitching duel for the ages. The Astros' Don Wilson and the Mets' Tom Seaver faced each other in a battle that lasted six hours. Seaver went ten innings, allowing no walks and just two hits. Wilson went nine innings, allowing five hits and three walks. After the starters exited, 11 relievers, 7 for the Mets and 4 for the Astros, tried to end the game. The game finally ended in the 24th inning when the Aspromonte hit a shot toward Mets shortstop Al Weiss. Weiss had been perfect all night at short, but he was not quick enough to make the play. The ball zipped into left field, allowing Norm Miller to score. So with baseball expansion and trades, the Astros dramatically changed in 1969. As Promonte was sent to the Braves and Staub was traded to the expansion Montreal Expos in exchange for outfielder Jesse Alou and first baseman Don Clendon. However, Clendon refused to report to Houston, electing to retire and take a, take a job with a pen manufacturing company. The Astros asked Commissioner Bowie Kuhn to avoid to void the trade, but he refused. Instead, he awarded Jack Billingham and a left-handed relief pitcher to the Astros to complete the trade. Kuehler was traded to the Baltimore Orioles for Kurt Blafari. Other new players included uh, catcher Johnny Edwards and Dennis Menke and pitcher Denny LeMaster. Wilson continued to pitch brilliantly on May 1st through the second no-hitter of his career in that game, and he struck out 18 batters, tying what was the all-time single-game mark. He was just 24 years of age and was second only to Sandy Koufax for career no-hitters. Wilson's no hitter in the Astro lit the Astros fire after mi- a miserable month of April, and six days later the team tied a major league record by turning seven double plays in a game. By May's end, the Astros had put together a ten-game winning streak. The Houston infield tandem of Menke and Joe Morgan continued to improve, providing power at the plate and a great defense. Morgan had 15 homers and 49 bases, while Menke led the Astros with 90 RBIs. The Menke-Morgan punch was beginning to come alive, and the team was responding to Walker's management style. The Astros dominated the season series against their expansion twins, the New York Mets. In one game the New- at New York, Dennis Menke and Jimmy Wynn hit grand slams in the same inning against the Mets team that would go on to win the World Series that same year. The Astros finished the 1969 season with a record of 81 wins and 81 losses, marking their first season of 500 ball. In 1970, the Astros were expected to be a serious threat in the National League. In June, 19-year-old Cesar Cedeno was called up and immediately showed signs of being a superstar. The Dominican outfielder batted 310 after being called up, not to be outdone. Menke batted 304, and Jesus Alou batted 306. The Astros' batting average was up by 19 points compared to the season before. The team looked good, but the Astros' ERA was up. Larry Dierker and Wilson had winning records, but the pitching staff as a whole had an off season. Houston finished in fourth place in 1970. Okay, pop in the chat here real quick. Nothing new, so let's continue on. 
1971 through 1974, The Boys in Orange. The fashion trends of the 1970s had started taking root in baseball. Long hair and loud colors were starting to appear on team uniforms, including the Houston Astros. In 1971, the Astros made some changes to their uniform, but they kept the same style they had in previous seasons, but inverted the colors. Uh, what was navy was now orange, and what was orange was a lighter shade of blue. The players' last names were added to the back of their jerseys. In 1972, the uniform fabric was also changed to what was, at the time, revolutionizing the industry. Polyester. Belts were replaced by elastic waistbands and jerseys. Uh, zipped up instead of having buttons. The uniforms became popular with fans, but would last only until 1975 when the Astros would shock baseball and the fashion world. The uniforms were about the only thing that did change in 1971. The acquisition of Roger Metzger from the Chicago Cubs in the offseason moved Mankey to first base, Bob Watson to the outfield. The Astros got off to a slow start and the pitching and hitting averages were down. Larry Dierker was selected to the All-Star Game in 1971, but due to an arm injury, he could not make it. Cesar Cedeno led the club with 81 RBIs and the league with 40 doubles, but batted just 264 and had 102 strikeouts in the second season with the Astros. Pitcher J.R. Richard made his debut on September of, of the 1971 season against the Giants. Let me pop in the chat here real quick. Fox Bama's in the house. How you doing there, Fox Bama? Fox Bama. I don't know why I say Bama all the time. Fox Bama. From Alabama. Uh, let's see. Fox, Bama, how goes it? Good, just at home, chillin'. J.R. Richard is a beast. <laughs> All right, then we have the big trade. In November 1971, the Astros and Cincinnati Reds made one of the biggest blockbuster trades in the history of the sport and helped create the big red machine of the 1970s. With the Reds getting better, uh, getting better the end of the deal, Houston sent second baseman Joe Morgan and infielder Dennis Menke and pitcher Jack Billingham and outfielder Cesar Geronimo and prospect Ed Ambrister to Cincinnati for first baseman Lee May, second baseman Tommy Helms, and infielder Jimmy Stewart. The trade left Astros fans and the baseball world scratching their heads as to why general manager Speck Richardson would give up so much for so little. The Reds, on the other hand, would shore up many problems. They had an off year in 1971, but were the National League's pennant winner in 1972. The Astros' acquisition of Lee May added more power to the lineup in 1972. May, Wynn, Raider, and Cedeno all had 20 or more home runs, and Watson hit 16. Cedeno also led the Astros with a 320 batting average, 55 stolen bases, and made spectacular plays in the field. Cedeno made the first All-Star game in 1972 and became the first Astros player in team history to hit for the cycle in August versus the Reds. The Astros finished the strike-shortened season 84-69 and for their first winning season. Astro fans had hoped for more of the same in 73, but it was not to be. The Astros' run production was down, even though the same five sluggers the year before were still punching the ball out of the park. Lee May led the Astros with 28 home runs, and Cesar, Cesar Cedeno batted 320 with 25 home runs. Bob Watson hit the 312 mark and drove in 94 runs. Doug Rader and Jimmy Wynn 
both had 20 or more home runs. However, injuries to their pitching staff limited the Astros to an 82 and 84th place finish. The Astros again finished in fourth place the next year under new manager Preston Gomez. All right. Let's see. In 1975 through 1979, cautious corporate ownership. With the $38 million deficit of the Astrodome, control of the Astrodomain, including the Astros, was passed from Bob Hofheinz to GE Credit and Ford Motor Credit. The creditors were just interested in preserving asset value of the team. So... Any money spent had to be found or saved somewhere else. So Tal Smith returned to the Astros from the New York Yankees to find a team that needed a lot of work and did not have a lot of money. However, there would be some bright spots that would prove to be good investment in the near future. The year started on a sad note. Pitcher Don Wilson was found dead in the passenger seat of his car on January 5, 1975. The cause of death was asphyxiation by carbon monoxide. Wilson was 29 years old. Wilson's number 40 was retired on April 13, 1975. The 1975 season saw the introduction of the Astros' new uniforms. Many teams were going away from the traditional uniform, and the Astros were no exception. From the chest down, the uniform was solid block of yellow, orange, and red stripes. There was also a large dark blue star over the midsection. The same multicolored stripe ran down the pant legs. Uh, Players' numbers not only appeared on the back of the jersey, but also on the pant leg. The bright stripes were meant to appear as a fiery trail like a rocket sweeping across the heavens. The uniforms were panned by critics, but the public liked them and versions started appearing at the high school and little league level. The uniform was so different from what other teams wore that the Astros wore it both home and on the road until 1980. Besides the bright new uniforms, there were some other changes. Lee May was traded to Baltimore for much talked about rookie second baseman Rob Andrews and utility player Enos Cabell. In Baltimore, Cabell was uh, stuck behind third base Brooks Robinson, but he took advantage of his opportunity in Houston and became their everyday third baseman. Cabell would go to become a big part of the team's success in later years. With May gone, Bob Watson was able to move to first base and was a bright spot in the lineup, batting 324 with 85 RBIs. The two biggest moves in Astro, the Astros made in the offseason were the acquisitions of Joe Necro and Jose Cruz. The Astros bought Necro from the Braves for almost nothing. Necro had bounced around the big leagues with minimal success. His older brother, Phil Necro, had started teaching Joe how to throw his knuckleball, and Joe was just starting to use it when he came to the Astros. Necro won six games, saved four games, and had an ERA of 3.07. Jose Cruz was also a steal, in retrospect, from the Cardinals. Cruz became a fixture in the Astros' outfield for several years and would eventually have his number 25 retired. Pop in the chat here real quick. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Three car collectors. I have to do a bunch of homework. Just came in to say hi. All right, Caleb. Nice to have you pop into the stream with us here. Appreciate you being here, buddy. Yeah, make sure you get your homework done. Make sure you do your assigned tasks. And then you can have time for fun stuff when your schoolwork's done. That's good. Uh, say hey, three card. <laughs> 
All right, despite high expectations, 1975 was among the Astros' worst in franchise history. Their record of 64 and 97 was far worse than even the expansion Colt 45s and would remain the worst record in franchise history until 2011. It was the worst record in baseball, and manager Preston Gomez was fired late in the season and replaced by Bill Verdon. The Astros played 500 ball under Verda, Verda in the last 34 games of the season. With Verdon as manager, the Hu- the, Hus- the Astros improved greatly in 1976, finishing in third place with an 80 and 82 record. A healthy Cesar Cedeno was a key reason for the Astros' success in 1976. Bob Watson continued to show consistency and led the club with a 313 average and 102 RBIs. Jose Cruz became Houston's everyday left fielder and hit 303 with 28 stolen bases. The 19 in 1976 saw the end of Larry Dierker's playing career as an Astro, but before it was all over, he would throw a no-hitter and win the 1,000th game in the Astrodome. The Astros finished in third place again in 1977 with a record of 81-81. and One of the big problems the Astros had in the late 70s was that they were unable to compete in the free agent market. Ford Motor Credit Company was still in control of the team and was looking to sell the Astros but would not spend money on better players. Most of the talent was either farm-grown or bought cheaply. Right. Da, da, da. Three cards, hey, Robert Home, by everyone. Jose Cruz was a beast, too. Yes. Yeah, yep, Jose Cruz did play for um, the Houston Astros, coming up here soon. The 1979 season would prove to be a big turnaround in Astros history. During the offseason, the Astros attempted to fix some of their problem areas. They traded Floyd Bannister to Seattle for shortstop Craig Reynolds and acquired catcher Alan Ashby from Toronto for pitcher Mark Lemangelo. Uh, Reynolds and Ashby were both solid in their positions and gave Houston some much-needed consistency. Um... The season started with a boost from pitcher Ken Forsh, who threw a no-hitter. The Braves, the second game of the season. In May 1979, New Jersey shipping tycoon John McClellan had agreed to buy the Astros. Now with an investor in charge, the Astros would be more likely to compete in the free agent market. The Astros were playing great baseball throughout the season. Jose Cruz and Enos Cabell both uh, stole 30 bases. Joe Necro had a great year with 21 wins and a 3.00 ERA. J.R. Richard won 18 games and set a new personal strikeout record at 313. Joe Sambito came into his own with 22 saves as the Astro closer. Things were going as they should for a team that could win the West. The Astros and Reds battled the final month of the season. The Reds pulled ahead of the Astros by a game and a half. Later that month, they split a pair, and the Reds kept their lead. That would be how it would end. The Astros finished with their best record to that point, 89-73, and and one and a half games behind the National League winner, the Reds. With Dr. McClellan as sole owner of the Astros, the team would now benefit in ways a corporation could not give them. The rumors of the Astros moving out of Houston started to crumble, and the Astros were now able to compete in the free agent market. McClellan showed the city of Houston that he too wanted a winning team, signing nearby Alvin, Texas, native Nolan Ryan to the first million dollar a year deal. Ryan had four career no-hitters already and had struck out 383 in one season. Let me pop in the chat here. 
Brewers Cards Forever. Oh my word, Brewers Cards Forever. Brewers Cards Forever. We got to take a pause in the action here. I got to add something to my list here for my end of the month. <laughs> I like that. Brewers cards forever. Nolan Ryan rules. There we go. Nolan Ryan rules. <laughs> Thanks there, Brewers cards forever. Really appreciate that super chat. Really appreciate that super chat. Deerman's in the house. How you doing there, buddy? Nice to see you there, Deerman. Hopefully you've been doing well. I haven't seen you in a while. Sure, hope you're doing much, much better. Um, oops, wait a minute. Oh, there we go. Now, now it's... picked back up here. So, um, let me continue on with where we left off. Okay, Dearman said he got his package. That's cool. Yeah, I'm pretty sure three card collectors had gotten his... Dearman's gotten it. I'm for sure everybody's received their packages now that I sent out for this month from the big sale and my Patreon packages and things of that nature. So without further ado, I'm going to continue on here. But thanks again, Air Brewers Card, for that super chat, that $5 super chat. Nolan Ryan rules. Appreciate that very much. Super, super awesome of you to do that. So 1980 to 1985 is the next section. I got the one team bag. The one team, the team bag. Thank you. Yep. Hopefully that was really good for you. Um, I was going to send a birthday present in there, but through the month, remember, I, I bought, bought you a couple of birthday gifts through the month, so that's why I did that. Okay, dear man, good to hear from you. Yeah, but I think I gave you a little bit extra cards in your team bags this month because it was your birthday month okay i got some nice hits <laughs> exactly i'm glad you enjoyed that there dearman so 1980 to 1985 more rainbow and seasons on the brink joe morgan returned in 1980 the 1980 pitching staff was one of the best houston ever had with the fastball of Ryan, the knuckleball of Joe Negro, and the terrifying six foot eight inch frame of J. R. Richard. Teams felt lucky to face Ken Forsh, who had a double digit winner in the previous two seasons. Richard became the first Astros pitcher to start in the All Star game. <laughs> See, it's been a while since you've been here, Dearman. Um, after a medical examination three days later, Richard was told to rest his arm and he collapsed during a July 30th workout. He had suffered a stroke after a blood clot in the arm apparently moved to his neck and cut off blood flow to the brain. Surgery was done to save his life, but the Astros lost their ace pitcher after a 10-4 and four start with a uh, stingy one uh, Point eight nine ERA. Richard attempted a comeback but would never again pitch a big league game. After the loss of Richard and some offensive struggles, the Astros slipped to third place in the division behind the Dodgers and the Reds. They bounced back to first with a 10-game winning streak, but the Dodgers had regained a two-game lead when they arrived in Houston on September 9th. The, Houston, the Astros won the first two games of that series, and the two teams were tied for the division lead. The Astros held a three-game lead over the Dodgers, with three games left in the season against the Dodgers. The Dodgers swept the series, forcing a one-game playoff the next day. The Astros would, however, win the one-game playoff 7-1 to and advance to their first postseason. 
the team would face the Philadelphia Phillies in the 1980 League Championship Series. And the Phillies sent out Steve Carlton in Game 1 of the NLCS after a six-hour flight the night before. The Phillies would win the opener after the Astros got a one to nothing inning lead. Ken Forsh pinched are pitched particularly strong fourth and fifth innings, but Greg Lazinski hit a six-inning two-run two bomb to the 300-level seats of Veteran Stadium. The Phillies added an insurance run on the way to a 3-1 one, to one win. Houston bounced back to win games two and three. Game four went into extra innings with the Phillies taking the lead and the win in the 10th inning. Pete Rose started a rally with a one-out single. Then Luzinski doubled off the left field wall and Rose bowled over catcher Bruce Bochy and scored the go-ahead run. The Phillies got an insurance run on the way to tie in the series. All right, uh, pop my head in the chat here real quick. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Robert, I just checked the email. I did receive it. Look for a reply soon. Okay, that must be lucky, lucky talking to Robert there. All right. Um, rookie Phillies pitcher Marty Bystrom was sent out by Philadelphia manager Dallas Green to face veteran Nolan Ryan in Game 5. The rookie gave up a run in the first inning, then held the Astros at bay until the sixth inning. An Astros lead was lost when Bob Boone hit a two-out single in the second, but the Astros tied the game in the sixth with an Allen Ashby single scoring Denny Walling. Houston took a 5-2 lead in the seventh inning. However, the Phillies came back with five runs in the inning. The Astros came back against Tug McGraw with four singles and two two-out runs. Now in extra innings, Gary Maddox doubled Dell Unser with one out to give the Phillies an 8-7 lead. And the Astros failed to score in the bottom of the 10th inning. In 1981, a 1981 player strike ran between June 12th and August 10th. Ultimately, the strike would help the Astros get into the playoffs. Nolan Ryan and Bob Nepper picked up steam in the second half of the season. Ryan threw his fifth no-hitter on September 26th and finished the season with a 1.69 ERA. Nepper finished with a ERA of 2.18. In the wake of the strike, Major League Baseball took the winners of each half season and set up the best of five divisional playoffs. The Reds won more games than any other team in the National League, but they won neither half of the strike divided season. The Astros finished 61 and 49 overall, which would have been third in the division behind the Reds and the Dodgers, advancing to the playoffs as winners of the second half. Houston beat Los Angeles in their first two playoff games at home, but the Dodgers took the next three in Los Angeles to advance to the NLCS. By 1982, only four players had three starting pitchers remain, remained from the 1980 squad. The Astros were out of pennant contention by August and began rebuilding for the near future. Bill Verdon was fired as manager and replaced by original Colt 45 uh, Bill Lillis. Don Sutton asked to be traded and was sent to the Milwaukee Brewers for cash and the team gained three new prospects, including Kevin Bass, minor league player Bill Duran was called up in September, and Bass also got a look in the outfield. The Astros finished fourth in the West, but new talent was starting to appear. All right. Good to go there. Before the 1983 season, the Astros traded Danny Heap to the Mets for pitcher Mike Scott. A 28-year-old who had struggled with New York, Art Howe, set out the 1983 season with an injury, forcing Phil Garner to third and Ray Knight 
to first. Duran took over at second, becoming the everyday second baseman for the next seven seasons. The Astros finished third in the National League West. The 1984 season started off badly when shortstop Dickie Thon was hit in the head by a pitch and was lost for the season. In September, the Astros called up rookie Glenn Davis after he posted impressive numbers in AAA. The Astros finished in second place in 1985. Mike Scott uh, learned a new pitch, the split finger fastball. Scott, who was coming out of a 11-5 season, had found his new pitch and would become one of Houston's most celebrated hurlers. In June, Davis made the start starting lineup at first base adding power to the team. In September, Joe Necro was traded to the Yankees for two minor league pitchers and lefty uh, Jim DeShales. The, the Astros finished in fourth place in 1985. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Bass is Trout's cousin. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's for sure. All right, and then uh, I will with great anticipation. All right, so however, the signature game of the series was Game 6. Oh, wait, the 1986 National League Championship Series against the New York Mets was noted for its drama and it's cons- is considered to be one of the greatest postseason series in Game 3. The Astros were ahead of at Chase Stadium 5-4 to four in the bottom of the ninth when closer Dave Smith gave up a two-run home run to Lenny Dykstra, giving the Mets a dramatic 6-5 win. However, the signature game of the series was Game 6, needing to win... Uh... To get Mike Scott, who had been dominated in the series in Game 7, the Astros jumped off to a 3 nothing lead in the first inning, but neither team would score again until the ninth inning. In the ninth inning, starting pitcher Bob Nepper would give up two runs, and once again the Astros would look to Dave Smith to close it out. However, Smith would walk... Gary Carter and Daryl Strawberry giving up a sacrifice fly to Ray Knight, tying the game despite having a go ahead the go ahead runs on base. Smith was able to escape the inning without any further damage. There was no scoring until the fourteenth inning, when the Mets would take the lead on a Wally Blackman or Wally Backman uh, single and an error by left fielder Billy Hatcher. The Astros would get the run back in the bottom of the 14th when Hatcher, in a classic goal-to-hero conversion moment, hit one of the most dramatic home runs in NLCS history off the left field foul pole in the 16th inning. Darrell Strawberry doubled to lead off the inning and Ray Knight drove him home in the next at-bat. The Mets would score a total of three runs in the inning and take what appeared to be an insurmountable 7-4 to four lead. With their season on the line, the Astros would nonetheless rally for two runs to come within 7-6. to six. Kevin Bass came up with the tying and winning runs on base. However, Jesse Orozco would strike him out, ending the game. At the time, the 16-inning game held the record for the longest MLB postseason history, the Mets won the series 4 to 2. After the 1986 season, the team had officially had difficulty finding success again. Several changes occurred. The rainbow uniforms were phased out. The team electing to keep a five-stripe rainbow design on the sleeves. Uh, from 1987 to 1993, the Astros wore the same uniform for both home and away games. The only team in Major League Baseball uh, to do so during that period. Its favorites, Nolan Ryan and Jose Cruz, moved on and the team entered a rebuilding phase. Craig Biggio debuted in June of 1988, joining 
new prospects, Ken Caminetti, Gerald Young. Biggio would become the everyday catcher by 1990. A trade acquiring Jeff Bagwell in exchange for Larry Anderson would become one of the biggest deals in Astros history. Glenn Davis, Glenn Davis was traded to Baltimore for Kurt Schilling, Pete Harnish, and Steve Finley in 1990. Okay. Uh, make sure I didn't miss anything. Hey, Kevin's car collecting's back. Hey, Kendall. Um, Kendall's in here. Sorry I'm late. Just well, No problem, Kendall. Hey, things happen, especially during this time and days with everything going on. Um, oh, that's right. This is this is we're coming up on the killer bees section now, aren't we? Yep, the killer bees are going to be coming up here soon. All right. So let me continue on here. The 19, 1991 through nineteen ninety nine fine tuning. The early 1990s were marked by the Astros' growing discontent with their home, the Astrodome, after the Astrodome was renovated for the primary benefit of the NFL's Houston Oilers, who shared the Astrodome with the Astros since 1960s. The Astros began to grow increasingly disenchanted with the facility, faced with declining attendance and the Astrodome and the inability of management to obtain a new stadium. In the 1991 offseason, Astros management announced its intention to sell the team and move the franchise to the Washington, D.C. area. However, the move was not approved by the other National League owners, thus compelling the Astros to remain in Houston. Shortly thereafter, McCullen, who also owned the NHL's New Jersey Devils, sold the team to Texas businessman Drayton McLean in 1993, who committed to keeping the team in Houston. Shortly after McLean's arrival, which coincided with the, ma the maturation of Bagwell and Biggio, the Astros began to show signs of consistent success. After finishing second in their division in 1994 in a strike year, the 1995 and the 1996 the Houston Astros consecutive division titles in 97, 98, 99. In the 1998 season, the Astros set a team record with 102 victories. However, each of these titles was followed by a first round playoff elimination in 1998 by the San Diego Padres, in 1997, and 1999 against the Atlanta Braves. The manager of these title teams was Larry Dierker, who had previously been a broadcaster and pitcher for the Astros. During this period, Bagwell, Biggio, and Bell, and Sean Berry earned the nickname the Killer Bees. In later seasons, the name came to include other Astros, especially Lance Berkman. Coinciding with the changing in ownership, the team switched uniforms and team colors after the 1993 season in order to go for a new, more serious image. The team's trademark rainbow uniforms were retired, and the team's colors changed to midnight blue and metallic gold. The Astros' font Font on the team logo was changed to a more aggressive one, and the team's traditional star logo was changed to a stylized flying star with an open left end. It marked the first time since the team's inception that orange was not part of the team's colors. Despite, despite the general agreement that the rainbow uniforms identified with the team had become tired and looked too much like a minor league team according to the new owners. The new uniforms and caps were never especially popular with many Astros fans. Off the field in 1994, the Astros hired one of the first Ameri African American general managers, former franchise player Bob Watson. Watson could leave the Astros would leave the Astros after the 1995 season to become general manager of the New York Yankees and help, help to lead the Yankees to a world championship in 1996. He would be replaced by Gary Hunsicker, who until 2004 would continue to oversee the building of the Astros 
into one of the better and most consistent organizations in, ma in the major leagues. However, in 1996, the Astros again nearly left Houston by the mid-1990s. McLean, like McCullen before him, wanted his team out of the Astrodome and was asking the city to build the Astros a new stadium. When things did not progress quickly toward that end, he put the team up for sale. He had nearly finalized a deal to sell the team to business man William Collins, who planned to move the team to Northern Virginia. However, Collins was having difficulty finding a site for the stadium himself, so Major League owners stepped in and forced McLean to give Houston another chance to grant his stadium wish. Houston voters, having already lost the Houston Oilers in a similar situation, responded positively via a stadium referendum, and the Astros played out. Okay, continue on here. It looks like everything's pretty much the same in the in the chat here. So that in 2000, 2000 to 2004, new ballpark and rebranding. The 2000 series saw a move to a new stadium, originally to be named the Ballpark at Union Station due to being located on the site of Union Station. It was renamed Enron Field by the season opening after the naming rights were sold to energy corporation Enron. The stadium was to feature a retractable roof, in particular useful feature with unpredictable Houston weather. The ballpark also featured more intimate surroundings than the Astrodome in 2002. Naming rights were purchased by the Houston-based Minute Maid Park after Enron went bankrupt. The park was built on the grounds of the old Union Station. A locomotive moves across the outfield and whistles after home runs, uh, playing homage to a Houston history which had 11 railroad company lines running through in the city by 1860. The ballpark previously contained quirks such as uh, Towles Hill, which was a hill in deep center field on which a flagpole stood, all in fair territory. Uh, Towles Hill was replaced in the 2016-2017 offseason. The wall was moved in to 409 feet, 125 meters, which the team hoped would generate more home runs. A similar feature was located in Crossley Field. Over the years, many highlight reel catches have been made by center fielder running up to the hill to make up the hill to make catches. With the change in location also came a change in attire. Gone were the blue and gold uniforms of the 1990s in favor of a more retro look with pinstripes, a traditional baseball font and the colors brick red and sand and black. These colors were chosen because ownership originally wanted to rename the team the Houston Diesels. The Shooting Stars logo was modified and still retained its definitive look. All right. After two fairly successful seasons with a playoff appearance, the Astros were early favorites in the 2004 National League pennant. They starred uh, pitcher Andy Pettit to a roster that already included standouts like Lance Berkman and Jeff Kent, as well as veteran veterans Bagwell and Biggio. Roger Clemens, who had retired after the 2003 season with the New York Yankees, agreed to join former teammate Pettit on the Astros for 2004. The one-year deal included unique conditions such as the option for Clemens to stay home in Houston on select road trips when he wasn't scheduled to pitch. Despite the early predictions for success, the, Houston, the Astros had a mediocre 44-44 record at the All-Star break. A lack of run production and a poor record in close games were major issues. After being booed in the 2004 All-Star game held in Houston, manager Jimmy uh, Wilson, 
Williams was fired and replaced by Phil Gardner, a star on the division-winning 1986 Astros. The Astros enjoyed a 46-26 record in the second half of the season under Gardner and earned a National League wildcard spot. The Astros defeated the Braves 3-2 in the division series, but would lose the National League Championship Series to the St. Louis Cardinals in seven games. Clemens earned a record 7th Cy Young Award in 2004. Additionally, the mid-season addition of Carlos Beltran in a trade with the Kansas City Royals helped the Astros tremendously in their playoffs run. Despite mid-season trade rumors, Beltran would prove instrumental to the team's hopes, hitting eight home runs in the postseason. Though he had asserted a desire to remain with the Astros, Beltran signed a long-term contract with the New York Mets on January 9, 2005. All right. 2005, the first World Series played in Texas. In 2005, the Astros started poorly and found themselves with a 15 and 30 record in late May. The Houston Chronicle had written them off with a tombstone em- emblazoned with RIP 2005 Astros. However, from that low point until the end of July, Houston went 42 and 17 and found themselves in the lead for a National League wild card spot. July saw the best single month record in club's history at 22 and 7. Offensive production had increased greatly after a slow start in the first 2 months. The Astros had also developed an excellent pitching staff, anchored by Roy Oswalt, um, 20 and 12 record with a 2.94 ERA, Andy Pettit, 17 and 9 with a 2.39 record, and Roger Clemens with a 13 and 8 record with a league low ERA of only 1.1. Eight, seven. The con- contributions of the other starters, Brandon uh, Back, 10 and 8, with a 4.76, and rookie starters, Evaquel Astacio, with a 3 and 6, 5.67, and Juan Wandy Rodriguez, with a 10 and 10, 5.53 uh, ERA, were less remarkable, but enough to push the Astros into position for a playoff run. The Astros won a wild card berth in the final day of the regular season, becoming the first team since the world champion 1914 Boston Braves to qualify for the postseason after being 14 games under 500. The Astros won the National League Division Series against the Atlanta Braves 3 to 1. With a game 4 that set postseason records for most innings, 18. Most players used a single team, uh, 23, and longest game time, 5 hours and 50 minutes, trailing by a score of 6-1. to one, Lance Berkman hit an 8th inning, inning grand slam to narrow the score to 6-5. to five. In the bottom of the ninth, catcher Brad Asmus hit a game-tying home run that allowed the game to continue into extra innings. In the bottom of the 10th inning, Luke Scott hit a blast to the left field that had home run distance but was inches foul. This game remained scoreless for the next eight innings. In the top of the 15th, Roger Clemens made his only his second career relief appearance, pitching three shutout innings. Uh, notably striking out Julio Franco at the time, the oldest player uh, in the MLB at 47 years old. Clemens was himself 43. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Clemens came to bat again, indicating that he would be pitching in the ninth inning, 19th inning. And if it came to that, Clemens struck out, but the next batter, Chris Burke, Hit a home run to left field for the Astros' win, 7-6. to six. Oddly enough, a fan in the Crawford boxes in left field had previously caught Berkman's grand slam, and this same fan caught Burke's home run. The National League Championship Series featured a rematch 
of the 2004 NLCS. The Astros lost the first game in St. Louis, but would win the next three games with Roy Oswalt getting the win. The Astros were poised to close out the series in Game 5 in Houston. Brad Lidge gave up a monstrous two-out, three-run home run to Albert Pujols, forcing the series to a sixth game in St. Louis, where the Astros clinched a World Series appearance. Roy Oswalt was named an LCS MVP, having gone 2-0 with a 1.29 ERA in the series. Currently Honorary National League President William Y. Giles presented the league championship champion Astros with the the Warren C. Giles Trophy. Warren Giles, William's father and president of the National League from 1951 to 1969, had awarded an MLB franchise to the city of Houston in 1960. The Astros faced the Chicago White Sox in the World Series. Chicago had been considered the slight favorite but would win all four games, the first two at U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago and the final two in Houston. Game three marked the first World Series game held in the state of Texas and was the longest game in World Series history, lasting five hours and 41 minutes. The World Series was marked by a controversy involving the Minute Maid Park roof. MLB and Commissioner Bud Selig insisted that the Astros must play with the roof open, which mitigated the intensity and enthusiasm of the cheering Astros fans. All right, make sure pop in the chat here real quick. Um, da, da, da. Dearman's back in the chat again. Must have popped out, popped back. Crickets. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we're back on track here. Um, so in 2006 to 2009, the decline. In the 2006 offseason, the team signed uh, Preston Wilson and moved Berkman to first base, ending the long tenure of Jeff Bagwell. The Astros renewed the contract with Clemens and, uh, and traded two minor league prospects to the Tampa Bay Rays for left-hander Aubrey Huff. By August, Preston Wilson complained about his playing time after the return of Luke Scott from AAA Round Rock. The Astros released Wilson and was signed by St. Louis, a dramatic season that included wins in 10 of their last 12 games. But the Astros missed a playoff appearance when they lost the final game of the season to the Atlanta Braves. On October 31st, the Astros declined a contract option on Jeff Bagwell for 2007, ending his 15-year Astro career and leading to his retirement. Roger Clemens and Andrew Pettit filed for free agency on December 12th. The Astros traded Willie Tavares and Taylor Buchholz and Jason Hirsch to the Colorado Rockies. The Rockies pitcher Jason Jennings and Miguel Asensio, a trade with the White Sox involving the same three Astros in exchange for John Garland, had been nixed a few days earlier when Buchholz reportedly failed a physical. In the end of Tavares' continued to develop, and Hirsch had a strong 2007 rookie campaign, while Jennings was often injured and generally ineffective. All right, on April 28, 2007, the Astros purchased the contracted top minor league prospect, Hunter Pence. He debuted that night, getting a hit and scoring a run. By May 2007, the Astros suffered one of their worst recent losing streaks, 10 games. On June 28, second baseman Craig Vigio became the 27th MLB player to accrue 3,000 career hits. Vigio needed three hits to reach the 1,000, and on that night he had five hits. That night, Carlos Lee hit a towel M in the 11th inning. Lee later uh, quipped to the news media that he had hit a walk-off grand slam 
and he got second billing. Considering Biggio's achievement, on July 24th, Biggio announced that he would retire at the end of the season. He hit a grand slam in the night's, that night's game, which broke a 3-3 tie and led the Astros to an, and led to an Astros win. In Biggio's last at bat, he grounded out to Chipper Jones of the Atlanta Braves. On September 20th, Ed Wade was named general manager. In his first move, he traded Jason Lane to the Padres on September 24th. On September 30th, Craig Vigio retired after 20 years with the team. In November, the Astros traded right-hand pitcher Brad Lidge and shortstop Eric Brunlett to the Philadelphia Phillies for outfielder Michael Bourne, right-hand pitcher Jeff Geary and minor league pit leader Mike Constanzano, utility player Mark Loretta, accepted Houston salary arbitration, and Kazu Matsui finalized a $16.5 million three-year contract with the team. In December, the Astros traded outfielder Luke Scott and Matt Albers, right-hand pitcher Dennis Sarfate, left-hand pitch pitcher Troy Patton and minor league third baseman Mike Costanzo to the Baltimore Orioles for shortstop Miguel Tejada. On December 14th, they sent infielder Chris Burt, right-hand pitcher Juan Gutierrez, uh, Chad Qualis, right-hand pitcher Chad Qualis to the Arizona Diamondbacks for right-hand pitcher Jose Valverde. On December 27th, the Astros came to terms on a deal with All-Star Gold Glove winner Darren Erstad. Okay, who we got in here? Brewers, hello Kevin, Dearman. Gorilla family's in the house. There we go. Dearman saying hi to Gorilla. Gorilla. Kendall. Alright. I sold Zion for 600 last night. AMG, wow, nice. Mm. So cool. You guys are chatting amongst each other in there. Um, looks like my phone has froze up, so I can't rely on that no more. I was kind of looking at it and didn't notice it was moving, but my chat on my computer was. Okay. Uh, in January and February 2008, the Astros signed Brandon Back, Ty Wigginton, Dave Borowski, and Sean Check on to one-year deals. The starting rotation would feature Roy Oswald and Brandon Bax as numbers one and two. Randy Rodriguez, Charcon, and Chris Sampson rounded out the bottom three slots in the rotation. Woody Williams had retired out after a 0-4 spring tra- training, and Jason Jennings was now with Texas. On the other side of the roster, the Astros would start without Kazu Matsui, who was on a minor league rehab assignment after a spring training injury. The Astros regressed in 2008 and 2009, finishing with a record of 86 and 75 and 74 and 88. Respectively, manager Cecil Cooper was fired after the 2009 season at the lowest point of the Regression, uh, children admissions were free. All right. So in 2010 and 2014, the last years in the National League and the move to the American League West. Um, Been good, brother. Hope all is well with you. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. Thanks, there, Gorilla. I appreciate that. Yep. Thumbs up in the stream, please. Thumbs up in the stream. All right. The 2010 season was the first season as Astros manager. Well, we're doing pretty good. We got 11 thumbs up now. Might be a few new people in here. Some people have left. But um, Astros manager uh, Brad Mills, who was previously the bench coach of the Boston Red Sox. The Astros. Rose struggled throughout a season that was marked by trade deadline deals that sent longtime Astros to other teams. On July 29th, the Astros' ace starting pitcher Roy Oswalt was dealt to the Philadelphia Phillies for J.A. Happ and two minor league players. On July 31st, outfielder Lance Berkman was traded to the New York Yankees for minor leaguer Jimmy pa- Padre. 
Paredes and Mark Melancon. The Astros finished with a 76 and 86 record. On July 30th, 2011, the Astros traded outfielder Hunter Pence, the team's 2010 leader in home runs, to the Philadelphia Phillies on July 31st. They traded outfielder Michael Bourne to the Atlanta Braves. On September 17th, the Astros clinched their first 100 loss season in franchise history. On September 28th, the Astros ended the season with an 8 and 0 home loss to the St. Louis Cardinals. Cardinals pitcher Chris Carpenter pitched a complete game, two hit shutout in the game, enabling the Cardinals to win the National League wild card, where they went to beat the Texas Rangers in the World Series. Lance Berkman being a key player in their championship victory, the Astros finished with a 56 and 106 record, the worst single season record in franchise history, a record which would be broken the following year. In November 2010, uh, Drayton McLean announced that the Astros were being put up for sale. McLean stated that because the Astros were one of the few franchises in Major League Baseball with only one family as the owners, he was planning his estate and McLean was 75 years old as of November 2011. In March 2011, local Houston businessman Jim Crane emerged as the frontrunner to purchase the franchise. In the 1980s, Craig Crane founded a, an air freight business, which later mar- merged with Siva Logistics and later found Crane Capital Group. McLean and Crane had previous handshake agreement for the franchise in 2008, but Crane abruptly changed his mind and broke off discussions. Crane also attempted to buy the Chicago Cubs in 2008 and the Texas Rangers during the 2010 auction. Crane came under scrutiny because of previous allegations of (coughs) discriminatory hiring practices regarding women and minorities. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Among other issues, <clears throat> this delayed MLB's approval process during the summer of 2011. Frustrated Crane hinted that the delays might threaten the deal. In October 2011, Crane met personally with MLB Commissioner Bud Selig in a meeting that was described as constructive. On November 15, 2011, it was announced that Crane had agreed to move the franchise to the American League for the 2013 season. The move was part of an overall divisional realignment for the MLB, with the National and American Leagues each having 15 teams in three geographically balanced divisions. Crane was given a $70 million concession by MLB for agreeing to the switch. The move was a condition for the sale to the new ownership group. Two days later, the Astros were officially sold to Crane after the owners were unanimously voted in favor of the sale. It was also announced that 2012 would be the last season for the U for the Astros in the National League. After over 50 years of the Astros being part of the National League, this move was unpopular with many Astros fans. In 2012, the Astros were eliminated from the playoffs before September 5th. On September 27th, the Astros named Bo Porter to be the manager for the 2013 season. Uh, da, da, da. Been good, brother. Hope all is well. Donald, you need a new phone or a better battery. What do you mean a better battery? Why, what's wrong? <laughs> um, yes, it is decent. My yard is very clean. Huh? I look for new projects. Boredom is a real friend. Hello, Robert. Hello, my yard is looking good as well. All this extra time at home. <laughs> Hi, gorilla. I have edged the front yard three times in the last four weeks, so I feel your preem, brother. (laughs) Oh, my word. I could use some help over here in Washington. It rains too much. 
All right, on October 3rd, the Astros ended. Over 50 years of National League play with a 5-4 loss to the Chicago Cubs and began to look ahead to join the American League, winning only 20 road games during the entire season. The Astros finished with a 55-107 and record, the worst record in all of Major League Baseball for the 2012 season and surpassing the 2011 season for the worst record in Astros history. On November 2nd, 2012, the Astros unveiled their new look in preparation for their move to the American League in the 2013 season. The uniform is navy and orange, going back to the original 1960s team's colors, as well as debuting the new version of the classic navy hat with the white H over the orange star. On November 6, 2012, the Astros hired former Cleveland Indians Director of Baseball Operations, David Stearns, as the team's new assistant general manager. The Astros would also go on to hire former St. Louis Cardinals front office executive Jeff Lunell as their general manager. The Houston Astros played their first game as an American League team on March 31st, 2013, where they were victorious over their in-state division competitor, the Texas Rangers, with a score of 8-2. to On May 17th, Reed Ryan, son of Nolan Ryan, was introduced as president of operations. On September 29th, the Astros completed their first year in the American League, losing 5-1 to five to one in a 14-inning game to the New York Yankees. The Astros finished the season with a 51-111 and record, a franchise worst, with a season-ending 15-game losing streak again surpassing their worst record from the previous year. The team finished 45 games behind the division winner Oakland Athletics, further adding to their futility. This marked three consecutive years that the address Astros had more than 100 games lost more than 100 games in a single season. They also became the first team to have the first overall pick in the draft three years in a row. In February 2014, Nolan Ryan rejoined the Astros front office as assistant to the owner, Jim Crane, general manager, Jeff Lundell, and president of business operations, Reed Ryan. From 2004 to 2008, he worked as a special assistant to the general manager. For the 2014 season, the team went 70-92, and 92, fish, finishing 28 games back to the division winner, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, and placing fourth in the American League West over the Texas Rangers, a A.J. Hinch was named manager on September 29th, replacing Bo Porter, who was fired on September 1st. Okay, getting closer here as we move on to our next year. Uh, Uh, Got to get the AC ready. Supposed to be in the 90s next week. Uh, stream seems fine to me. No freeze. Okay. Oh, I freeze every time you go live. Oh, my word. I think my phone's fine. I don't hear other people having problems with it. But you guys keep me posted on that, okay? It, might, it could be just your the internet, too. You have to make sure you have high-speed internet. That does help out for sure. So 2015 to the present. First World Series title and sign-stealing scandal. So in 2015, Dallas Kuchel led the American League with 20 victories, going 15-0 and at home. An MLB record. Key additions to the team included Scott Casimir and shortstop Carlos Correa, who hit 22 home runs in being called up in 
June of 2015, second baseman Jose Altuve picked up where he left off as the star of the Astros' offense. On July 30th, the Astros picked up Mike Fears and Carlos Gomez from the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, Fears threw the 11th no-hitter in Astros history on August 21st against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Houston got the final AL playoff spot and faced the Yankees. <laughs> In the wild card game on October 6th at New York, they defeated the Yankees 3 to nothing, but lost to the Kansas City Royals in the American League Division title. The Astros split the first two games of the ALDS Best of Five series in Kansas City. The Astros won the first game at Minute Maid Park to take a 2-1 lead in the ALDS. In Game 4, after 7 innings, the Astros had a 6-2 lead in the top of the 8th inning, which took about 45 minutes to end. The Royals had taken a 7-6 lead with the series of consecutive base hits. The Astros suffered a 9-6 loss, and the ALDS was tied at 2-2. Then the series went back to Kansas City, where the Royals clinched the series in the fifth game, 7-2. The Astros entered the 2016 series as the favorites to win the AL West after a promising 2015 series season. After a bad start to their season, with Houston going 7-17 and in April, the Astros bounced back and went on to have a winning record. In the next four months, including an 18-8 and record in June, but after going 12-15 and in September, the Astros were eliminated from playoff contention. And they finished third place in the American League West Division with a final record of 84-78. and All right, looks like the chat's been moving a little bit here. Let me catch up, scroll back up here. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, uh, Gorilla Family says Dave Durango showed me a trick the other day to set your video to the best settings. It defaults to lower settings, and picture looks and picture looks great. Oh, I I kind of know what you're talking about there, but I'm pretty sure I've got my video settings on. Uh, I, yeah, I do that. You do that in the settings, and I know I've got that. Um, let me just check real quick, make sure. Yeah, I've got the. Hmm. Let me see if this helps any. I did update something just now. Oh, there we go. Wow, that does. How things look now? A little bit clearer, maybe? I was playing with the settings there. You guys let me know if that looks any better with my feet. Uh, no problem with my feet. All is good, Donald. Um, da, da, da. I can... The cards look great, Kevin. I am only kidding, buddy. My first time seeing it. Uh, only 21 welcome. I love the 87 tops choice. I uh, might have an ideal MG. Laugh out loud. Promise I will. One will end up in your mailbox one of these days. Donald, your end is fine. It's the viewer that has to change. Oh, okay. No, but I did. Uh, I actually notice it a little bit better now to myself. Um, let's see. I know my settings here. Yeah, I don't know why my computer does this sometimes. There, that even looks better on my computer right now. Let me check one more spot here real quick. Let's see. Live chat there. Let me go into my settings here for some reason. 
That's not up there. The higher quality. Oh, there we go. That looks a little bit better on my end. Not that it probably looked too bad for you guys. All right, so the season was... I'll continue on now that I got all that. I read through there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the viewer has to do that. And, of course, the viewer, when you are watching this stuff, you do have to have a higher-speed internet to get the clear, the clear type end product. So the season was marked by the Astros' 4-15 and record against their in-state division rival and eventual division winner, the Texas Rangers. The Astros finished the 2016 season 11 games behind the Rangers. In 2014, Sports Illustrated predicted the Astros would win the 2017 World Series through their strategic rebuilding process. As of June 9th, the Astros were 41 and 16, which gave them a 13 and a half game lead over the rest of their division. And they had a comfortable possession of the best record in the entire league. This was best the best start in the Astros 55 year history as the games of as the games of June 23rd concluded, the Astros had an 11 and a half game lead over the rest of the division. The Astros entered the All-Star break with an American League best 60 and 29 record and a 16 game lead in the division. Although oh, the overall best record in MLB had just barely slipped to the Dodgers shortly before the All-Star break just by one game. With the Hurricane Harvey causing massive flooding throughout Houston, and Southeast Texas, the Astros' three-game series against the Rangers for August 29th to 31 was relocated to Tropicana Field, home of the Tampa Bay Rays in St. Petersburg, Florida. As the area covered from the hurricane, many residents rallied around the, the Astros who adopted the mantra Houston Strong and wore a patch on their jerseys with the mantra for the remainder of the season. At the August 31st waiver trade deadline, GM Jeff Ludnow acquired veteran starting pitcher and Cy Young Award winner Justin Verlander to bolster the starting rotation. Verlander won each of his five regular season starts with the Astros yielding only four runs over his stretch. He carried success into the playoffs posting a record 4-1 and one in his six starts and throwing a complete game in Game 2 of the ALCS. Verlander was named the 2017 ALCS MVP. The Astros clinched their division uh, title as a member of the American League West Division and first division title overall since 2001. They also became the first team in Major League history to win three different divisions. National League West in 1980 and 1986, the National League Central from 1997 to 1999 and 2001, and the American League West in 2017. On September 29th, the Astros won their 100th game of the season, the second time the Astros finished a season with over 100 wins, and the first being the in 1998. Okay, pop my head in the chat here. I might have an idea. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> I was talking about the chat freezing. I see you just fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mo, my, my chat is frozen on my phone, that's for sure. All right. So uh, they finished with uh, 101 wins and 61 losses with a 21-game lead in the division and faced the Red Sox in the first round of the American League playoffs. The Astros defeated the Red Sox three games to one and advanced to the American League Championship Series against the New York Yankees. The Astros won the ALCS four games to three and advanced to the World Series to play against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Astros defeated the Dodgers in the deciding seventh game of the World Series, winning the first championship in franchise history. The victory was especially meaningful for the Houston area, which was rebuilding after Hurricane Harvey. 
The city of Houston celebrated the team's accomplishment with a parade on the afternoon of November 3rd, 2017. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo estimated at least 750,000 people attended the parade. On November 16th, 2017, Jose Altuve was named the American League Most Valuable Player, capping off a historic season in which he accumulated 200 hits for the fourth consecutive season, led the major leagues with a .346 batting average, and was unquestioned clubhouse leader of the World Series champions. On September 26, 2018, the Astros' second consecutive American League West championship was clinched with a victory by the Seattle Mariners over the Oakland A's for the third time in franchise history and second consecutive season. The team won over 100 games. They finished the regular season 103-59, and a new franchise record, by sweeping a doubleheader against the Baltimore Orioles on September 29, 2018. The Astros swept the Cleveland Indians in the ALDS to advance to the ALCS to face the league-leading Boston Red Sox, who finished the season 108 and 54 after a 7 2 victory in game one of the ALCS. The Astros dropped the next four games and Boston advanced to the World Series. In the offseason, the Astros signed veteran outfielder Michael Brantley and catcher Robinson Chirinos at the trade deadline on July. 3rd. 31st, 2019, Houston acquired another veteran starting pitcher and Cy Young Award winner Jack Granke to bolster the starting rotation. On September 22nd, the Astros clinched their third consecutive American League Division title. They finished the season with a record of 107-55, and their best in franchise history and best record in MLB baseball. They became the first team since 2000. 2000- Two to 2004 New York Yankees to have three consecutive 100-win seasons. They also became the first team in MLB history to have three consecutive 100-loss seasons and three consecutive 100-win seasons in the same decade. Okay. Uh, Gorilla, during my last sale, I inserted one of my cards in each of the packages I sent out. That's how certain people got them. There are a few folks, yourself included, that I will send one to. (laughs) Uh, Mr. Brown, Kendall Brown, is in the house. Um, How are you today, bud? Robert, um, ouch. (laughs) Why are you saying ouch? (laughs) Robert, Uh, Entering the playoffs as the top-seeded team in both leagues, they defeated the American League wildcard winner, Tampa Bay Rays, in five games in the ALDS, advancing to the ALCS for the third year in a row to face the New York Yankees. In Game 6 at Minute Maid Park, Jose Altuve hit a walk-off home run to win the pennant and send them to its third World Series appearance. However, they lost the 2019 World Series to the Washington Nationals in seven games, taking three games in Washington, but losing all four of their games at home. Right, and one last closing note to everybody's pretty much well familiar about... um, Sign stealing scandal. On November 12, 2019, Ken Rosenthal and Evan Drellick wrote an article in The Athletic detailing allegations that the At- Astros had used cameras to engage in potentially illicit sign stealing against opponents, relying on allegations from former Astros pitcher Mike Fears as a public source and other allegations from unnamed sources. The Astros were alleged to have used scouts watching catcher signs in real time behind the dugout at Minute Maid Park to crack the signs and bring, and banging a trash can loudly to indicate what kind of pitch was coming. The scandal rippled through the baseball world as internet sports personal personality John Boy published videos that appeared to clearly show the scheme. 
Further allegations regarding other means of relaying science, such as whistling, surfaced in subsequent weeks, and MLB, MLB and Commissioner Rob Manfred announced a sweeping investigation into the allegations. On January 13, 2020, MLB announced that its investigation found that the Astros did use cameras and video monitors to steal signs of opposing catchers and signal to hitters throughout the 2017 regular se- season and postseason, and at least part of the 2018 season, the investigation found no evidence of sign stealing in their pennant winning 2019 season. The report said that Alex Cora, then the Astros bench coach, Carlos Beltran, and other unnamed players were involved in developing the scheme. It said Hinch neither devised the banging scheme nor participated in it, but did not stop it or tell Cora he disapproved of it. Manfred announced that manager A.J. Hinch and general manager Jeff Lunau were suspended for one year. The team would be fined $5 million, the maximum allowed under MLB rules, and the team would lose its top two draft picks in both the 2020 and 2021 MLB drafts. About an hour after MLB's announcement, the Astros owner Jim Crane announced he had terminated both Hinch and Lunau, saying he was unaware of the scheme and extraordinarily troubled and upset, extraordinarily troubled and upset, and concluded, we need to move forward with a clean slate. We will not have this happen again on my watch. In a statement, Ludnow denied knowledge of the scheme. Hinch issued a statement saying, while the evidence consistently showed I didn't endorse or participate in sign-stealing practices, I failed to stop them and I am deeply sorry. The scandal had repercussions around baseball. Cora was implicated in the report, but Manfred withheld a decision on his punishment until the complete completion of a separate investigation into electronic sign stealing in 2018 when Cora was manager of the Red Sox. However, the report led the Red Sox to dismiss Cora two days after it was published. And the Mets did the same with Beltran, who had been hired as manager shortly before the original The Athletic Story that same week. On January 29, 2020, the Astros announced they hired Dusty Baker as their new manager to replace Hinch. So there we Boom Slang's in the house. How you doing there, Boom Slang? So there we have it. The history of the Houston Astros in a nutshell. Pretty long history there. <laughs> Boom Slang said lies. Uh, yo, sup everyone. Um, Lucky Lucky says, hey, Boom Slang. Kendall says, Boom Slang. Boom Slang says, I'm good. All right. So, boom. That takes care of part one. Again, part two, no, no family mail call today. But we will continue in our search for the elusive remaining rookie card medallion cards that I'm trying to find. You can see my checklist here. If I hold it at the right angle, you can see there's more tick marks and less to go. I think I've got, how many do I got left? I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Got eleven more to go. Less than a dozen. And Kevin is keeping an eye on my checklist, and so is Randy Johnson. So without further ado, we will get ready to open up this blaster box here and finish off our live stream for today. In case you're wondering what we are doing here. Okay, I think I've got there that all set there all right and we will put the box in the back here so 
hopefully you guys are doing well. Um, read which ones you need. Oh, you want me to read which ones I need for my rookie card medallions? Here, instead of holding it there, um, I need uh, Mike Trout, um, Chris Bryant, Albert Pujols, Bo Jackson, um, Chipper Jones, Tony Gwynn, um, Jose Canseco, Dwight Gooden, Ricky Henderson, Roger Clemens, and Miguel Cabrera. I think I've got one of these coming in, but I can't remember. I'd have to double check. Um, but I think it's actually 12 on my list there, but I got to verify that and update that. But those are the 12 that I need, just in case you're wondering there. Oh, you have quite a few there, Gorilla Fountain. Well, I don't want you to mess up your collection if you're trying to collect some of them. Um, apparently, the bazooka backs are the thing, Boom Slang. Yeah, I'm going to be... I'll go into that a little bit later. But yeah, so we're going to uh, see if we can get another one of these today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get ready to rip in this box open here. As I continue to move through and go ahead and get ready to finish off our, our stream for today. There's the there. Let me um, put Pete Alonzo in his prominent spot here. As we get ready to rip through these, put that one on the bottom there. We'll open up that last. And the seven packs from the box. So we've got Pete Alonzo keeping track here. Mm. Oh, that, that's understandable. I, I know eventually I'll get a Gwyn. I will get a Gwyn. But uh, that's neat. You have the cons you have a Conseco there, Gorilla. That is cool. Um, yeah, if you if you want to send it my way, um, we could probably work out a trade, and I can I can uh, provide something for you. I do have lots of duplicates. I don't know if you're looking for any um, of the other ones. I could tell you whether I have more than one of some of the rookies. But uh, that would be cool. Would put me one closer. And then down the road, I'm sure eventually I'll find a Tony Gwynn in the rookie card medallions. So without further ado, um, let's continue moving through here so I can finish up my stream for today. So, J.T. Realmuto with the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, actually, I'm going to have to need a little bit more space there, too. There, let me move him just like that. Yeah, you can still see all the packs there. Um, Zach Greinke with the Astros. Just finished off their team history. Taylor Rogers with the Minnesota Twins. Alex Bregman with the Astros. Uh, Eric Fed with the Nationals, um, Tyler O'Neill with the uh, Cardinals, Trent Thornton with the Blue Jays, um, Tommy Pham with the Tampa Bay Rays, um, Anthony Rendon uh, with the Nationals, league leader card, um, Andrew Chafin with the Arizona Diamondbacks, um, I have the trout also. Email me. Uh, we can work something out. Okay. I've been searching through some of my very dysfunctionally organized collection for the Adobe. Have not found them yet. Don't worry. I will. There are only so many places he can hide. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um... I'm pretty sure I have your information, Gorilla. But um, if you did have a chance, um, my my email address, well, it's just donaldblomdahl at gmail.com. 
Okay, donaldblomdahl at gmail.com. Just one word at gmail.com, Donald Um. So, yeah. But, yeah, we can work something out there, uh, Gorilla Family. I wouldn't mind doing a trade. Um, do me a favor, send me an email, and then I will know kind of what you're looking for, and I can see if I can find what you're interested in, okay? Um, but, yeah. We can work something out. All right. Andrew Chafin with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Boom. There we go. Um, Reggie Jackson for the 1985 throwback card. All right. Um, is it that Raphael Devers? Yep. Raphael Devers for the turkey card here. Okay. Um, Hector Neris with the Philadelphia Phillies. And last but not least, Andrew Benatendi for Ethan's Elvis covers and more. All right, thanks. Thanks there, uh, Gorilla Family. Do appreciate that. But yeah, um, we can definitely work something out. I, I would not mind doing that at all. We can just work out a trade to make it, make it kind of fair that way. All right. Um, remember my specialty is Hall of Famers so if you're looking for some certain Hall of Famer cards those are my easiest that are readily available in my current sorting fashion but um, yeah we can work something out there Gorilla that'd be cool uh, Jeremy Jer Jeffries Jeffress with the Brewers um, Carlos Santana with the Indians uh, there we go Jordan Alvarez, Gold Cup rookie card. One of the hot rookies this this round, this year. Let me just throw him in the back here right now. Um, Max Muncy with the Dodgers. Um, Andres Munoz with the San Diego Padres. Shout out to Kevin's Car Collecting. Master and Apprentice. Uh, that's uh, Cruz and Garver with the Minnesota Twins. There's uh, Jorge Soler with the Royals, League Leader card. Anthony Rendon, World Series highlight card. Um, Steven Strasburg with the Washington Nationals, League Leaders. Mitch Hanniger, there we go, Mitch Hanniger. My first Seattle Mariner in the box. And Chris Bryant for my home run ch challenge. Home run challenge card. That's an HR8. HR. That's one of the ones that I need for my for my home run challenge set. So that is pretty cool there. Set that one right there. Anthony Rendon with the with the Nationals. And then we have Cesar Hernandez with the Philadelphia Phillies. Anthony Santander with the Baltimore Orioles. Rounds out the back there. All right. Keep them busy, Donald. I'll get that, Delby. <laughs> All right. So moving on to pack number three here out of the seven packs. Clayton Kershaw with the Dodgers. Uh, Ramon Lariano, future star card. Cole Calhoun with the Angels. Um, Max Scherzer with the Washington Nationals. Lords Gary L. Jr. with the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. Um, Danny Holtzen with the Cubs. Rookie card. Uh, Chance Sisko with the Baltimore Orioles. All right, Juan Soto World Series highlight card. Um, Tim Anderson with the White Sox league leader. Jose Abreu with the Chicago White Sox league leader. Boom, Tops Choice, Christian Yelich. Tops Choice. That is number 17 for the Tops Choice. Already have that one, but that's okay. Nice one to add to the collection for the subset cards. Buster Posey with the San Francisco Giants. Buster Posey. 
Turkey card. Um, Mike Fears with the Oakland Athletics. And David Peralta with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Shout out going out to Kevin's card collecting and more. All right, pack number four in the box. No problem there, Hats McGee. Anytime, buddy. Anytime, buddy. Anytime you don't have nothing to do, you can just turn on my two-hour video here and just go to town. <laughs> you can listen to the history of the Astros in the background while you're sorting cards or something of that nature. Jesus L Lazardo with the Oakland Athletics rookie card. Carlos Correa with the Houston Astros. Um, Brian Abreu with the Houston Astros rookie card. Miguel Cabrera with the Tigers. Uh, Nick Solak with the Texas Rangers rookie card. Jay Bruce with the Philadelphia Phillies. Robo Garcia with the Chicago Cubs rookie card. Gliber Torres with the Yankees. Garrett Cole league leaders card. Um, Caleb Smith with the Miami Marlins. Boom, we got a fall card. Jesus Aguilar with the Tampa Bay Rays. Nice fall card there. We got a Rice Hoskins here with the Philadelphia Phillies. Turkey card. All right, then we've got Michael Pineda with the Minnesota Twins. And Javier Baez with the Chicago Cubs. All right, pack number five here, next up to that. Hello, Hashos. What's up? Yeah, lucky, lucky. All right. So Tyler Alexander with the Detroit Tigers rookie card. Daniel Murphy, Colorado Rockies. Uh, Bobby Bradley, rookie card for the Indians. Um, Patrick Corbin with the Washington Nationals. Jesus Aguilar with the Tampa Bay Rays. Jorge Alfaro with the Miami Marlins. Max Scherzer, World Series highlights. Um, Emilio Pagan with the Tampa Bay Rays. Justin Verlander with the Houston Astros League Leader card. All right. Um, Brock Holt with the Boston Red Sox. There we go. San Diego Padres. Fernando Tatis Jr. 1985 throwback card. Aaron Judge. Turkey card. Then we've got uh, Chase Anderson with the Milwaukee Brewers. And Christian Stewart with the Detroit Tigers. All right. All right. Pack number six out of the first seven. All right. I think we might have a chrome in there. Something coming up curl on a little bit. Sometimes when these cards get older, you never know. Andrew Heaney with the California Angels. Um, AJ Puck with the Athletics. Rookie card. Sandy Alcantara with the Marlins. Um, Ian Hendricks with the Oakland Athletics. Soaking it all in. Celebrate a Gliber walk-off with the Yankees. Juan Soto with the Washington Nationals. Kevin McCarthy with the Kansas City Royals. There we go. Some horizontal cards. Trevor Bauer with the Cincinnati Reds. CJ Crone with the Minnesota Twins. Um, Aaron Nola with the Philadelphia Phillies. It is a chrome turkey card. Ozzy Albies with the Atlanta, Atlanta Braves. 
Oh my word, you can see I don't have my hat on. I was taking a break there for a little while. Gotta put my ball cap back on before we get to the end of the box here. That is cool. An Ozzy Albies Turkey Chrome Turkey card. There's uh, Yasiel Puig. Another turkey card here. So we got a bonus turkey out of this box, it looks like. Usually you get at least one per pack, but that was our insert card in that pack. Jose Urquidy, Houston Astros rookie card, and George Springer, Houston Astros. All right. So, boom, let me up. Let me go ahead and uh, put that chrome card right in front for now. Scoot these up a little bit. Move on to pack number seven here. Pack number seven. Um, Francisco Lindor with the Indians. Jose Barrios with the Twins. Luke Jackson with the Braves. Mike Talkman with the Yankees. Um, Idolmaro Vargas with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Shout out to Kevin's card collecting. Yeah, we do get a lot of Astros in here. I don't know why they're Astros. <laughs> Matthew Boyd with the Tigers. Um, Dansby Swanson with the Braves. Willie Adamas with the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Chicago Cubs team card. Uh, Tim and Yomer, Southside. Infielders celebrate a win. All right, there we go. A uh, decade's best 1990s Sammy Sosa card. Then we've got the AJ Puck, right? And the AJ Puck Oakland Athletics turkey card. All right, uh, Jake Rogers Detroit Tigers rookie card. And Whit Merrifield with the Kansas City Royals rounds out our regular packs. Only one Seattle Mariner out of that whole box. So, Astros McGee has no problem with finding the Astros, but that's the only Seattle Mariner I got. At least it wasn't Mitch Hanniger. All right. So let me move on here to our rookie medallion card. See who we can pull out here. Tops, one exclusive rookie card, respective rookie card, logo medallion card inside. And the winner is... My word. Did you guys get to see that peak? I think you guys probably did. I know I did. I'll just take it out. It's a Daryl Strawberry. A Daryl Strawberry. Let me get the, the sleeve in the back here. Got the Daryl Strawberry. I kind of rip roar and rip that open. Did not do the best rip there. Um, here. Put this in a in a top loader here. Put it in this one. I've got a I got the the right size a little bit later there. Boom! The Daryl Strawberry. I think I had one of these the other day. I got one in recently. Yep. So that that gives me two Daryl Strawberries I have now. Where did I? Oh, okay. There's my pen. So let me. Mark off that I have a second Daryl Strawberry. All right, a second Daryl Strawberry. Mark that off on my list there. Now I'll put the Daryl Strawberries in a double double stack. Boom. So there we go. I got a Daryl Strawberry rookie card. 
Pretty cool. New York Mets. Daryl Strawberry. 1984 throwback rookie card. That is, of course, my favorite year. That's why as soon as I saw what style it was, I was like, oh, my worst. That, my, my word, that had to be the New York Mets Dow Strawberry and the 84 throwback rookie card. All right. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that nice box, Donald. Have a great day. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera around and get ready to say goodbye to you guys in my normal fashion here. Let me move that Kino there out of the way. Let me move that out of the way for now. All right. And then, of course, our next show tomorrow will be our Hall of Famers. Our Hall of Famers. So let me get ready to say goodbye to you guys in my normal fashion. Kevin's card collecting by Mountain Gorilla. Yep. So this is Don Blondahl, Hall of Fame veteran, sports cards and collectibles, having been live to you today for our uh, uh, baseball team history video for uh, the Houston Astros. And now, uh, boom, opening up another blaster box. Tomorrow we will we'll be having our Hall of Fame Friday. Our Hall of Fame Friday uh, will be our... our Items for tomorrow. Oh, come on. What's wrong with this thing? My computer's being finicky. Got to do a reload here on my page. But yeah, we will be having our Hall of Fame Friday tomorrow. And moving on to our next series and that. So I'll be putting that, uh, pre-staging the scheduling for that video for tomorrow. So, um... So, cool, cool, cool there. So, um, just so you do have a little heads up on our eight Hall of Famers for our class for tomorrow. For um, 1971 is our induction year, uh, the years. But 1971 tomorrow, we have Dave Bancroft, uh, Jake Beckley, Chick Haffey, Harry Hooper, Joe Kelly, Ruby Marquard, Satchel Page, and George Weiss. All right, that will be our uh, team that'll be up for bat tomorrow. That will be our team that will be up for bat tomorrow. Will be our 1971 Hall of Famers. All right. So other than that, um, I can't think of anything else to go f go on from now till then so other than that um we will have a, a fairfield friday tomorrow i got a fairfield box to open up kind of like a precursor to to uh kevin's card collecting's uh fairfield friday that he does on friday evening and then i believe uh ethan's elvis covers and more is going to be doing another sale tomorrow he has his weekly sales that he works on and does so um I'm going to go ahead and get ready to sign off for today. So that is our schedule for tomorrow coming up. And then uh, taking place with everything that we do on my channel. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's uh, history video lesson. I'm wearing my Seattle Mariners team shirt. That's what I do when I do uh, the, the team histories. In case you're wondering... So other than that, I'm going to get ready to, to sign off for today. I know I'll have to sign back on because I know my uh, chat on my device here, my phone, ended up locking up. So I'm going to go ahead and say my goodbyes. You guys have a great and wonderful day. We will see you guys around the channels. And you guys take care, okay? Have a great and wonderful day. And we'll see you guys around the channels. Bye now. Take care, and Lord bless you throughout your day, and see you tomorrow morning, 10.30 a.m., with our next video installment. Bye now. Take care.